Well, it feels good to be back on here doing another video on YouTube, and it's Q&A time. And I know I go through my strings where I do some Q&A videos and then I don't. I need to get relatively religious about doing at least one of these a week, and that is the intention going forward. Typically, they're supposed to be on Saturday, but thanks to having to spend six hours watching Wrestle Kingdom 12, this got pushed off till Sunday, so I apologize, but that's what it is. But thanks for your questions. Remember, you can tweet your questions at OTRS Central on Twitter is the Twitter handle. And when I request the questions, that's when you reply. And I try to answer as many of them as I can, but unfortunately I cannot answer every one of them every single time, but I do what I can. So let's go ahead and get started then. Michael Corvin, my man, asks two questions. First, when will there be a black version of the OTRS Central shirt? That is a great question. In order to get to the point where I could do more designs on Pro Wrestling Tees, I need to send a, sell probably still about 10 more t-shirts in order to get across the threshold that allows me to do more than four designs. Looking back, I thought this design was solid. Some of the other ones were kind of rushed just because they gave me the option to do four. I probably should have stuck with this one and then, like you said, maybe a black version. Once we get to that point, then there will be a black version. So people need to go to the OTRS Central store at Pro Wrestling Tees and buy this shirt. And the quicker that happens, it's all about, I think it's, I think it's 10 of them total, maybe nine, but just 10 of them, 10 people buy one shirt, then I can do more designs. Um, then the second question, Finn Balor is the star of the Cruiserweight division, a good idea or a bad idea? Now, thinking about how much I dislike Finn Balor, I will put that aside, which I can do, um, also thinking about how there's a danger of getting associated with the cruiserweight division because once you get in that cruiserweight division, you will be stuck in that cruiserweight division in Vince's mind, which really doesn't make a whole lot of sense because there's quite a number of guys on the main roster at the higher end of the card that damn near fit in the cruiserweight classification anyway, so what's the difference? But when I look at Finn Balor, I think it would be a glorious idea for him, and here's why. It would allow him to be a shining beacon in a division that really needs some type of life. It would give him more focus and more purpose than what he currently has, because what are they doing with him currently anyways? Furthermore, thinking about it from a business standpoint, knowing they just canceled one of the um, 205 Live live events because of dismal ticket sales, and that's the only reason why they did logistics. My ass is the logistics of they didn't sell enough damn tickets. If Finn Balor can go on as a headliner on those shows and they start to sell out those venues and they start to do good business, then it is a way for him to show that he has some type of drawing power with some type of segment of the audience, which may allow him to buck that trend and get outside of that cruiserweight stigma. At this point in time, he's just going to toil in the mediocrity of the mid-card of WWE's uh, main Raw show. So why not go in a different direction and see what happens? Because the way he's going now, nothing's ever going to change. It's not going to happen. So he needs to find a place to happen. And the Cruiserweight division would be the best, most natural place for it to happen. Brian Walner. Should the college football playoff have a higher-seeded team at home for the semifinal round instead of being at the bowl games? No. They should be expanding the playoff to be more than four teams. Every rationale, reason, justification given to keep it at four teams is stupid and invalid and flat out ignorant, period. Only the NCAA, when it comes to college football, which is crazy because you would think one of their biggest money makers is March Madness attorney that now has, what, 68 teams in it? We can't get past four in college football? It's just ridiculous. It's just dumb. On the college basketball side, you get, what, 20% of the teams out there involved? And in college football, you get, what, 3%, 4%? That's stupid. How can you determine a true national champion? If lower levels of college football can figure it out, then the big boys can too. Richard Collier, will Vince ever bring back WCW like he did ECW? Hell no. That stuff is RIP dead buried. He uses the WCW name, likeness, uh, video library to make profit like he has for the past 16 plus years, almost 17 years now. He's not bringing that brand back. Too much time has elapsed. Too many people that were once WCW fans don't even watch any wrestling anymore, let alone WWE, let alone would be hip to a new WCW, especially with what happened with the new WWE CW. Oh, God. No, no, no. Not going to happen. Mid Carter J. Appropriate name for this question. What's better, Jeff Jarrett in WCW or Jeff Jarrett in TNA? 
when you use Jeff Jarrett and better in the same sentence, they just don't go together. It's like an oxymoron. So neither one of them were better because they were both terrible, both stupid, and both absolutely suck. Imputations. Should there be a five-second rule when retrieving the Money in the Bank briefcase where if you don't get it in five seconds, then it's next man up? I believe we could call it the Dak Swagger rule. And maybe we extend it to 15 to 20 seconds. But yes, I'm totally in favor of a swagger rule. If you're too stupid to where you can't successfully unhook that briefcase in a 15 or 20 second span, then at that point in time, there should be a buzzer that goes off in the arena that indicates you're a ding-dong dipshit and you no longer are going to be the Money in the Bank winner. You call an audible down there to the refs, you figure out the finish, and then you go with somebody else. Because if they can't unhook the briefcase, how could you count them to potentially be a world champion for your company? I know. It makes absolutely no sense. So yes, it's a great idea, imputations. I am totally in favor of a swagger rule for the Money in the Bank matches. Colton587, with SummerSlam in New York every year, should they have it at Madison Square Garden instead of the Barclays Center? Uh, yes. That would seem to make infinitely more sense to me. I realize Barclays is newer and everything, but MSG is MSG. The Garden is the Garden. The Barclays Center can eat shit in the grand scheme of things. But if you're going to make it your big show of the summer, then it should be at Yankee Stadium. If you're not going to do something like MetLife Stadium, then you need to have it at one of the baseball parks. What, what's Met's home field? Is that City Field um, or Yankee Stadium? It needs to be somewhere like that if you're going to do it in New York every year. But they shouldn't have it in New York every year. Uh, I feel like that's kind of dumb. It's just me. Uh, Char Char TV. Would it be Who would be a good coach for the Chicago Bears? Honestly, at this point in time, just somebody that knows what the hell they're doing. Somebody that's going to surround themselves with good people. Somebody, preferably, that would have some understanding of the offensive side of football. It would be ideal if they were somebody that had a track record of working with young quarterbacks and helping them develop and get better. So you point to somebody like Frank Reich or Joe DiFilippo uh, with the Philadelphia Eagles. You look at somebody like Pat Shermer from the Vikings. You look at somebody like uh, Pete Carmichael for uh, the New Orleans Saints with his ties to Ryan Pace and the Saints. Um, any one of those guys. Um, it'd be ideal if they kept Vic Fangio there as the defensive coordinator. That would be nice. Um, so I don't have like one name that I'm going to hitch my wagon to. I'm keeping an open mind in the search process. And we'll see what they come up with. If they hire some dumb dick defensive coordinator, then and it's not Vic Fangio, then they're morons and they deserve whatever the hell they get. Uh, David Murgon, if in charge of WWE's creative, who would you put the Raw titles on? That is a great question that I'm not sure that I have an answer to currently. I don't really know that it matters that much. I'm just being honest. Uh, Dave Garcia. Would you like it if Santina enters the women's Royal Rumble match? It feels like that's a given. It feels like it has to happen, doesn't it? And honestly, if you're going to do 30 women anyways, they don't have 30 women on the roster. Even if you bring up the women from NXT and a couple of surprises, you have room. Santina for the Rumble, FTW, period. Imagine the reaction. That shit would be awesome. And any of the freaking... Feminazis or stuff would be like, oh, you took your spot for a women, screw you, your rumble match is stupid any goddamn ways. Put Santina in. Fuck off. Real Benzillion. Have the Washington Wizards hit their peak as a team? It most certainly feels that way. I just don't see where there's going to be much growth or improvement, even if Otto Porter developed into a true blue third star on that team. I just don't see where their ceiling is much higher in their current configuration. I just don't. I mean, I think Wall is an elite dude. Um, and you've got Beal there, and you've got Porter to a certain degree. But they just... Now, to be fair to them, you're in a conference right now with the Cavs and the Celtics. So how much further are you really going to go? Um, but yeah, I feel like they've hit their peak as a team. I don't know how they're going to get much better. Uh, Charles McCain asked a question that a couple of other people, I think, asked as well. Did you watch The Last Jedi, and if so, your thoughts? I will talk about it really quickly without really providing any true spoilers. Um, yes, I did watch it. 
And here's exactly what I would say, is that going to this movie, um, and I went and I had a good time. I got caught up in the emotion of it being a Star Wars movie. I got caught up in the emotion of seeing Luke Skywalker all throughout. Skip de skip, whoop de woo, blah, blah, blah. So, at first glance, I enjoyed the show tremendously. Because this typically happens when I watch Star Wars. The first time I watch one of the movies, I don't think that much. I'm able to just kind of shut it down a little bit. I just kind of follow the movie and go with the movie. It's when I go back and watch it a second time, a third time, a fourth time, a fifth time, that sometimes I start to poke some holes in the stories and the characters, and I start to not like it as much. And my fear with The Last Jedi is this, is I did enjoy it the first time because I didn't really think, and that's the truth. That doesn't mean that you're stupid if you liked it. It just means that I turned off the analytical side of me for this movie somehow, some way, which is not something you see me do a lot with wrestling anyways, for the most part. But I know if I go back and watch it a second time, I'm going to be poking holes in that movie all over the damn place, and when that happens, I'm going to hate the movie. And I can see both sides of why some people really, really liked the movie, and I can see why some people really, really didn't like the movie. And like I said... Sometimes when we watch a movie more than once, the more you watch it, the more you find different things about it, and the more you like it. When it comes to Star Wars, for me, it tends to be, especially with certain ones, the more I watch it, the more I end up not liking it. And I'm afraid that's what's going to happen here. I'll Sure, I'll watch it multiple times over the next couple of years, and I'll probably grow to hate it. Right now, I enjoyed it quite a bit, but that was for the reasons I already outlined. I don't know that it was honestly a great movie or a great Star Wars movie. Um, Horror Movie Review 73. What was the better year in the Attitude Era, 1998 or 2000? I will go with 98. 98 saw the true ascension of Austin and Rock to the top of the company. You had Taker versus Kane in that whole story. You had Taker versus Mankind in King of the Ring that year. You know, you had so many things happen. Like when I think back to 2000, yeah, Rock and Triple H did their thing, and the product was still going strong, but there's so many better things about 1998 to me. That was my favorite year of the Attitude Era. ENC 98, how is the Man Cave coming, and when will it be featured? I mean, technically, I record in the Man Cave now. As you can see, the background is still the same. Here's part of the issue. So I've continued to buy stuff, even though I'm not doing the unboxing videos right now, surely to the joy of some of you. Um, I realize that for like buying posters and stuff, uh, I've also got to buy the frames because I just, just want to pin them up. It's like that, that kind of ruins the edges and the corners of the posters. I don't want to do that. Um, and then for other merch that I've already bought, um, I need display shelves or cases and things. And that's going to take time. I've been kind of lazy, especially with the holidays and so on and so forth. So I haven't went about redoing this whole room. Um, but I imagine it probably will happen pretty soon. So stay tuned, stay tuned. Eric Dennis, are we finally going to get Cena versus Orton for the WWE title at WrestleMania? Sadly, unfortunately, probably not. That is just one of those dreams that you and I and millions of other WWE fans deep, deep down in the cockles of our heart and soul are just going to have to hold on to forever. One of those matches that was thought of and unfulfilled. I mean, and just think about how stupid that is. If this doesn't represent the stupidity of WWE, what does? Cena and Orton were their arguably top two guys for an entire decade, and they never faced off one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania. Hogan faced off with Warrior. Hogan faced off with Savage. Hogan faced off with Andre. Bret and Shawn faced off. Shawn faced Austin. Austin faced Rock three freaking times. And at no point in time did anybody in this company think it might be a good idea to save it, wait, and build towards Cena and Orton at WrestleMania one-on-one. -on -one. Just the mind-numbing stupidity of it all is astounding. Whether or not you should have or could have or needed to do what you did with these guys for a decade, the fact is they did. And the fact is, you absolutely have no real story that you can point to other than, what was it, their forgettable three-way with God at WrestleMania 24? Hey, good luck, you're going on right after Ric Flair and Shawn Michaels. 
Let me know how that goes, bitches. I mean, seriously. Just so stupid. Just so, so dumb. I just can't believe it. All these years later, I still can't believe it. Like, idiotic. Even seeing him Batista faced off of Mania. Unbelievable. Costello, how much can we trust Dave Meltzer's match ratings? In my humble opinion, especially when it comes to New Japan, absolutely not at all. It is a clear-cut example of bias creeping in because, while well, I believe he's on New Japan's payroll, and I don't have proof of that, but what we do have proof for of is he's too buddy-buddy with guys like the Young Bucks and Omega and shit, and he's too much of a mark for New Japan to trust anything that he says about that brand with any type of credibility whatsoever. It's that simple. Nobody is perfect. No wrestling company is perfect. And how often does he really ever truly criticize New Japan? He pumps them so full of smoke, it is freaking ridiculous, and it ruins any and all little credibility he had when it comes to the match crap anyways. Furthermore, when you're talking about a star rating system, and you're talking about giving matches six stars and six and a quarter stars, no, you don't do that. Then you make your scale from zero to six stars. You don't go from zero to five stars. And then sit there and say this match was so above and beyond and then you're talking about how Okada's and Omega are working something for 15 minutes and they totally forget about it. No, what you're saying is, is that if it's above the maximum rating that it was beyond perfect, it was transcended, it's the greatest match you've ever seen, it would be the thing you put in a time capsule 100 years from now and ask people to open up the time capsule and say this is what professional wrestling is supposed to be about. And none of those matches we see today are like that. And for anybody to say that, it's just completely asinine. It is so asinine to see people do these stupid fucking star ratings where it used to be years back my nitpick was, and it was a big one because it's a viable one. You've given all the matches on this show three, three and a half, four stars out of five, which means 60, 70, 80 percent in terms of the scoring out of 100. But yet you turn around and you give the show an eight and a half or a nine out of ten. That just doesn't add up. That just doesn't make mathematical sense. Your star rating is flawed. Your scoring is stupid. You are an idiot. And now we're talking about giving matches six stars and six and a quarter stars and all this other dumb crap. It's just dumb. Because to me, people get too free and too loosey-goosey when it comes to grading. I mean, so many people I see give, like, decent matches four and a half, five stars. No, that's not how it's supposed to work. Four and a half stars are supposed to be great effing matches, and there aren't that many great effing matches. I don't care how much of a geek or a fanboy you are for this dumb crap. Let alone when you start getting into five star. Five star is supposed to be perfect. Like, absolutely no flaws. Everything was ex executed crisply. Every moment of the match made sense. The finish was on point. The right decision happened. It, just so many things go into it. The story told during the match, the characters, everything has to play out perfectly. And you see so many matches given five-star ratings where that does not happen. Guys don't sell. They kick out of 20 fucking finishers and all this other dumb crap. So no, his match ratings are stupid and he can pound them up his ass because he's influenced... I can't take it away from him because it's the truth, but it's unfortunate. He's influenced so many other fans to think that that's the way you're supposed to enjoy wrestling and sit there and worry about goddamn match ratings. It's stupid. Just stupid. And if I saw him face to face, I'd tell Meltzer Magoo and the Omega Cucks that they fucking suck and they're stupid and they've helped kill the enjoyment of wrestling. And they've helped kill what should be professional wrestling. It's not the evolution of the business, it's the de-evolution of the business. Evan Voorhees, your reaction if Taker returns as the American Badass? Next question. You son of a bitch. Ahmed. Is Braun over enough where he doesn't need the title or do they need to put it on him before it's too late? He's over, sure, but he needs the title. They need to cement him as a top guy. They need to permanently establish him as a top guy. He needs the strap. He should have already gotten the strap, but he most certainly should have the strap by mania. Doubtful it's going to happen, 
But no, what's going to happen is, is if you don't eventually put the strap on him, you're going to lose interest in him, you're going to go in other directions, and you're going to completely forget about it, and you're going to lose a golden opportunity. He needs a world title sometime in 2018, period. Lorida asks, worst Undertaker match you saw off the top of your head? Uh, WrestleMania 9 Giant Gonzalez has to be the top of the list. Some of the smart asses might say him and Roman at 33, and God, that was bad and that was brutal. But the funny thing is, is that actually told the story it was supposed to tell. It was the necessary match to tell all of us, including Taker, that it was time to move the F on. So I don't think that was his worst match. I will throw another Mania match in there. Is the one at 19, that handicap tag with him taking on um, A-Train in the Big Show where Nathan Jones comes running out. God, that was terrible. That was so terrible. When they talk about like worst taker matches of all time, maybe him and King Kong Bundy at 11, those are bad. He had some stinkers at Mania over the years because he had some stinker opponents. And then closing us out, Mr. Mike Law, can I get a birthday shout out? Yes. Yes, you can. I'm sure this is after your birthday, but F it. Mr. Mike Law, happy birthday. Thank you for having watched this channel for a long period of time, being so a supporter of OTR Essential. Thank you for following the show on Twitter. Thank you for always asking these questions for the Q&A videos. Thanks for watching these videos. You rock, sir. You rock, sir. Period. Happy birthday to you. And here's too many, many more. I hope you got paid. I hope you got made. And most importantly of all, by your hand or by somebody else, I hope you got laid. Happy birthday to you. Thanks again for all your questions, guys. Remember, go to the Otera Central Store at Pro Wrestling Tees and buy the damn shirt. And as the shirt says, remember Otera Central. It's not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. And that's important in these days and times in professional wrestling.